I have been fortunate to work with a number of great leaders through my time in education, government, and business. But I don't know that I've ever seen a more complete leader than the one here with us tonight. Bob Iger, a 40-year veteran of the Disney Company, became CEO in 2005, a time when Disney was just emerging from the turbulence and dysfunction of the so-called Disney Wars. One of the world's most iconic brands was in free fall, and the stock price had flatlined for almost a decade. Today, brand strength has been restored at Disney, as the company was recently acknowledged as the most reputable company in the world, with the fourth most recognizable brand. The stock price has increased by more than 300% since 2005, more than three times the increase in S&P's 500, and the market cap has tripled. Bob Iger is the architect of this resurrection. From the onset, he set a clear business strategy focused on strengthening the business brand, the Disney brand, producing extraordinary branded content, embracing and exploiting the dig digital revolution, accelerating international expansion, and developing fully the enormous potential for synergies across all Disney divisions. This strategy has led to an explosion of intellectual property through internal development and acquisition, and, and includes last year's Frozen, the most successful animated feature of all time, and three of the top five box office films of 2014 to date, and we may have a fourth one coming. For the future, among so many other things, we can all look forward to productions from ABC, Disney Animation, Pixar, Marvel, and Disney Star Wars, in theaters, on TV, and the internet, and in the retail stores, theme parks, and Disney games. Some analysts believe the incredible store of intellectual property now owned by Disney, the synergies across Disney's divisions, and Disney's international initiatives will make Disney a growth company for uh, several decades to come. Bob Iger is someone for whom I have the deepest respect, not only for his very visible achievements, but for his integrity, commitment to his people, and the extraordinary values-based culture of aspiration, innovation, and collaboration he has restored and enhanced. It is an honor for me to introduce Bob to the University of Washington and the Northwest community, which I will do shortly. But first, Bob will be interviewed tonight by award-winning journalist Cecilia Vega. As a correspondent for ABC News, she has covered events ranging from the election and inauguration of President Obama to the nuclear energy crises in Japan. She's also interviewed people ranging from presidents to Hollywood celebrities. We are very happy she was able to join us this evening. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to present Ms. Cecilia Vega and one of America's truly extraordinary CEOs, Bob Iger, Chairman and Chief Executive Officer of the Walt Disney Company. <laughs> be our guest. If I got that wrong, that would be, <laughs> that was your that would not be good news. I thought we would uh, start at the very beginning because I've heard a story about how you started, which is that you wanted to be an anchor and you wanted to be a weatherman and you went into production and then you had this boss and um, I don't know how to say this delicately, but he didn't really pin you for a leader. What did he tell you? <laughs> yes, I, I, I had my um, heart set on being a uh, TV anchorman, 
and I was a weatherman in a small town in upstate New York where it rained a lot and taught me how to give people bad news, by the way. <laughs> and uh, I, I, early on, I didn't believe that that career would take me very far because I was realistic about my talents. And uh, I got a job as a, basically a production assistant at ABC 40 years ago this summer. And uh, my first boss, who was, um, let's just say, a slightly corrupt, <laughs> um, told me that I was not promotable. Oops. And he was somewhat wrong. <laughs> uh, but that was, uh, at 23, to be told that by your boss was sort of jarring. But I was able to overcome that. And, I would say. Yeah, and I here would I am, say. 40 years later. So now I wish you were still alive to see just how promotable I was. But unfortunately, he's not with us anymore. I was going to ask you what happened to the boss, but I know that he, you called him corrupt, so he didn't last very long for a while, right? <laughs> he didn't. It took me a while to uh, convince people that I was right. So now that you are the boss, you're tasked with hiring people, you're tasked with surrounding yourself by uh, people that you put in these positions of authority, what are the qualities that you look for in leaders, in those that you're hiring and those that you surround yourself by? Well, there are a number of them, uh, some more important than others, but when you add them all up, I think they um, become extremely important as a package. And I look for a number of things. I think curiosity is extremely important. I like people that have the energy to um, discover, to explore, to learn a lot more. Uh, and that's something that I find fairly detectable in people early on, whether they're curious or not. Um, I like leaders that are optimists, I like because people don't really want to follow pessimists. Uh, I like people that have focus, that have a plan, uh, that can express that. So the communication becomes really important. Um, I like leaders that treat people fairly, <laughs> unlike the boss that told me I wasn't promotable. Uh, I think it's really important in, in that vein to uh, allow people to make mistakes if they're honest mistakes, not give anybody room if they're dishonest mistakes. I like people that are thoughtful, and thoughtfulness is, a, I think, an often um, overlooked quality in people. And what I mean by that is people that take the time to learn about a subject or study something so that they can have a point of view on it, so that they can be thoughtful about it. It's particularly important when you're leading people because often you're looked at or your people turn to you to express a point of view. And if that point of view comes from having done some study, I think that becomes incredibly important. Uh, decisiveness, obviously, not second-guessing, not taking too much time to make decisions, taking enough time to be smart about them, but not belaboring them too often. Uh, those are just a number of qualities that I look for in people, and I look for in, in people as leaders of the Walt Disney Company. And, and there, there are definitely others, but those are among the, the most important. Okay, so name, name names. Who are some of the leaders that, um, that have really influenced you over the course of your career, over the course of your life? I've had uh, the rare opportunity to work for some extraordinary people and to work with some extraordinary people. Um, early on, I've spent 10 years of my career at ABC Sports, which then was known as the leader in sports television. Now it's ESPN, fortunately, because we, we own ESPN. Uh, <laughs> we didn't know that. <laughs> uh, then it was Wide World of Sports and the Thrill of Victory and the Agony of Defeat, for those of you old enough to remember that. A guy that crashed <laughs> off the ski jump and lived. Um, and there, ABC Sports was run by a man named Rune Arledge, um, and I had the opportunity to work in the organization that he ran for 10 years. He was an unbelievable risk taker. By the way, that's an important ingredient of leadership as well, the ability to take risks, to take chances. And Rune was that. He was also an incredible competitor and an innovator and a perfectionist, which is another quality I like in, in, uh, in people. And that was 10 years of my life. And he just taught me that you didn't take no for an answer. You kept demanding basically the best out of people. 
Um, and, and I like the notion of being competitive too. That's required of us in jobs like this. Uh, he was succeeded by a man named Tom Murphy, who was the CEO and chairman of a company called Capital Cities, which bought ABC. And I worked for Tom for 10 years as well. The most um, respected leader that I knew in the sense that he was just a man of unbelievable integrity. And every decision that he made uh, was made from the integrity that was within him. Uh, that was, it's not that, I think you're born either having integrity or not, but when you watch somebody in an important position exercising integrity and never sacrificing that, at a somewhat impressionable time in my life, that became quite important. And then I worked for Michael Eisner for 10 years, who had had um, 21 years as CEO of the Walt Disney Company, the first 10 with unbelievable success. And Michael had um, a creative genius within him. Uh, he had a way of looking at creativity in very exacting ways, very specific in terms of what he saw. And watching him and, and learning from him became extremely valuable to me. So those three loom large in, in my career and in my life. And then I had the opportunity in uh, 2000 and Five, 2006, when we acquired Pixar and Steve Jobs was the controlling shareholder on 50% of Pixar, he became uh, the, the uh, largest shareholder of the Walt Disney Company and a member of our board. And he and I got very close and he had extraordinary influence on me, even at a later stage in my career. So I've had just this incredible string of great fortune in working with people who are visionaries, people of integrity, people with great creativity, Innovators, Steve is certainly one of them. People with a lot of courage, a lot of guts. And so I, I, I stand here or sit here tonight as the CEO of the Walt Disney Company, um, having had this incredible education in all different kinds of leadership and the ingredients that it takes to you know, run a large organization in a very, very dynamic marketplace successfully. The best of the best. You mentioned something that jumped out at me right now, risk taking. And I'm, I'm fascinated by that phrase at a, at a company the size of Disney, where creativity is at the core of what you do, and taking risk comes with failure sometimes, often. It can be 50-50, right? Win or lose. How do you let people know that it's okay to take those risks when failing is such a huge possibility? Well, many of the decisions that we make are creative decisions. You get pitched an idea for a TV series or a movie, or a theme park attraction, uh, and you've got to decide, and oftentimes, in our case, pretty expensive decisions. You say yes, you're committing a substantial amount of the company's capital uh, to that. You say yes, and um, there's inherent risk associated with that because creativity, which is, I think, one of the things that I love so much about it, is not something that you judge necessarily with math or science, you judge it really with instinct and gut. And that's fun in a way uh, because you're making a decision based on emotion more than anything else. On the other hand, it's like walking a tightrope without a net all the time. Or I often say it's like facing a great pitcher uh, knowing that you're gonna strike out more often than you're gonna get a hit. For math, instance. Right? Yeah. And it's kind of scary, and it takes, I think, a certain quality, a certain personality to manage that, but that's really what we do. So risk is really part of um, our business DNA. It exists all the time. And with that comes not only the ability to uh, say yes uh, at something that is not that measurable going in, but also the ability to manage it, or the fail you know, failure if it occurs, and that's an interesting dynamic too, because I find as a leader as well, you, you're called upon to make judgments all the time about people's judgment. And when you're in a, in a business of making decisions that has so little sort of science backing them up, you have to manage failure in a much more, you have to be much more tolerant to it uh, because their decision isn't necessarily any better than your decision might have been and there's an inevitability to it as well, and it, sometimes it's fairly omnipresent. Fortunately, as Oren mentioned, we've been on a good run, so we have, 
we haven't experienced that often. <laughs> but it's an interesting dynamic. But risk taking, I think, in a world that is changing so much is also, I think, an imperative. Uh, and um, it's something that uh, is not for the faint of heart, obviously, given the capital that we spend on the projects that we take risks on. I should also say, because I mentioned Pixar, and Oren was kind enough to say those great things about me. Uh, some, when I became a CEO in uh, October of 2005, so nine years ago, a few weeks ago. And um, Disney had suffered from a string of creative failures in, in its animation division, which is a division that's very valuable to Disney going all the way back to Walt Disney's day because it, it has so much value throughout the company, whether it's in theme park attractions or television consumer products. And we had been through a real dry spell, but the dry spell was a decade long. And so when I became CEO of Disney, one of my top priorities was to turn Disney animation around. And I thought long and hard about how to do that. And I kept coming back to a company called Pixar, uh, which we didn't own, but we had a, um, a distribution and uh, co-funding arrangement with in the terms of the movies that they made starting from Toy Story in 1995. And I met with the board in my first meeting as CEO, and I told them that turning animation around was my first priority. And I, they asked how I was going to do that, and I laid out a few options, and I said, one option is buying Pixar, but I didn't know whether they for, were, were for sale, and if they were for sale, it would be a lot of money. And I got a kind of an odd look from the board. Oren was not on the board then. But the process took a few months. I ended up calling Steve Jobs, saying, I got a crazy idea. He said, what's that? I said, maybe we should buy Pixar. And he said, well, maybe it's not that crazy. And we started in front of a whiteboard at the boardroom of Apple, to basically listing the pros and cons, which led to Steve essentially saying, I'm game if you're game. That led to, and then Oren joined the board, my going to the board some months after I became CEO and saying, I've got a great idea, we should buy Pixar, but it's $7.3 billion. <laughs> details, details. And Oren, who had just joined the board uh, having been at Starbucks, um, immediately understood the importance of that acquisition in, to the company, but also in terms of the value to the Disney brand and what that would mean for Disney if we turned animation around and how people would think about Disney worldwide. And he gave a fairly impassioned speech to the board in support of this crazy idea to spend $7.3 billion on an animation company. And the rest is history. We've never looked back. It had an unbelievable impact on Disney, on my career, actually, because it, it actually gave us the wherewithal to have the guts to buy Marvel for $4 billion and then Lucas for $4 billion. Uh, I'm not an easy CEO on a board, by the way. <laughs> I ask for a lot of money. Uh, but I remember Oren's uh, comments to the board very, very well. And it's interesting because when you talk about risk taking, it's not just in creativity, although the bet on Pixar was on whether their creative success could continue, which was totally unknown. Uh, and, but it's also about having a board that understands the strategy of the company and what the essence of the company is and how value can be created. And a board also needs to have the guts to basically support the risk-taking of the management team that runs the company, whether it's in engaging in new businesses, entering new markets, taking you know, all kinds of other risks in terms of spending on innovation and the like. And I've been unbelievably fortunate in the nine years I've had the job that I've had a board that has supported a strategy that has essentially been fairly risky mm -hmm. in nature. Fortunately, again, it's worked out. Do you ever just say, let it go? <laughs> We could sing the song, let it go. <laughs> you play Anna and I'll play Elsa. If you like. <laughs> I think it's time for questions. We got one in the back back there. Very back, yep. Hi, my name is Craig Kinzer with the uh, Burke Center for Entrepreneurship with the Foster School of Business. Uh, uh, thank you very much for attending uh, and speaking. My question is this, as you try to hire and retain uh, the most creative people, and once they're in your organization, keep them productive and creative, what are the one or two high priority policies or, or directives to keep them creative, to make sure they're in the most creative atmosphere or innovative atmosphere, innovation? 
how do you really foster innovation from maybe the type of facilities all the way to the way in which you organize or manage uh, teams for various projects? It kind of varies from organization to organization. So we have a number of entities at the company that have their own culture. And I realize that that may sound odd because 175,000 people you'd expect maybe it's in Disney on the, basically on, on the uh, sign on the door, so to speak, that it's one culture, but it's not. Because I've discovered over time, particularly in creative environments, that culture becomes very important in terms of the environment that's created to uh, enable people to uh, create in. Pixar is a good example of that. When we talked about buying Pixar, there are a number of things that we could have done as the acquiring entity, like changing the name on the door from Pixar to Disney, changing the, the email address or the business card or whatever, changing policies, not necessarily making them wear ties to work per se, but <clears throat> there are a variety of other things we could have done. And it was pretty clear to me, having actually been acquired twice in, in my career, that uh, that would be really a stupid thing to do because the environment that people worked in was definitely a contributor to the creative energy and the creative innovation and success that flowed from it. Uh, we have the same basically approach to Marvel and L Lucas and ESPN for that matter. If you were to go to Bristol, Connecticut today on the campus of ESPN where there are about 5,000 employees, you'd see kind of a, a different culture and you wouldn't necessarily see any signs of Disney even though a lot of what ESPN does reflects very much the the, um, the values of, of Disney to its, to its core. So that's certainly one thing that I'm quite cognizant of. I let essentially personalities continue to thrive and not try to homogenize or sanitize the culture of the personality of the company. ABC News, another example of that. When Disney bought ABC, the ABC News people worried that they were gonna have Mickey Mouse on their business card or there are all kinds of jokes. You it's can on our see. paycheck. Then Peter Jennings, <laughs> Peter Jennings was our Peter Jennings was our anchor, and I know there were political, there were cartoons and newspapers. Peter Jennings with the Mickey Mouse ears. I saw, by the way, after we bought Lucasfilm, there was a picture of the Death Star with Mickey Mouse ears from Star Wars, or Darth Vader with Mickey Mouse ears, or Darth Mickey. I've seen, I've seen that, and we haven't done anything like that because there's actually interesting, there's an interesting essence to each sort of creative center that the company has. So that's certainly one approach. Another approach is it goes back to understanding that with creativity comes a lot of uncertainty. And with uncertainty comes really the failure and success and the lack of an ability to predict. I talked earlier about tolerating honest mistakes from people or essentially giving people second chances for honest mistakes. Creative mistakes are, are really honest mistakes. And there's a, you just have to have the ability to roll with the punches. Now, if someone makes a number of them in a row, then this, you wonder whether they've still got it. That's another interesting dis 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 decision or discussion. But you can't beat somebody up after bringing an idea to fruition that really came from their heart and their passion if it doesn't work. It's, and it's not easy at a company, but our company thrives on our ability to attract great creative people and with that comes the need to give them the room to create and the room to fail when they create. It's interesting as a, in, as a CEO, it's interesting to uh, manage that kind of um, process in that kind of company. Here in the, on this side of the room here in the <coughs> tie, how about you right here, 13, table 13, right here in the front, yep. <coughs> I, not a question, but just a statement. I've long been a, an admirer of APG and any who built the Bank of America. And uh, he did it when he could run the bank with a committee of one. But uh, things are different today, but I think we're all fortunate that he covered the million dollar overrun on Snow White. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't be here today if he didn't, I guess, right? <laughs> That's very cool. You know, talk about risk taking. I mentioned Disneyland, which is a huge risk. The, the uh, overages or the cost to build Disneyland, which almost bankrupt Walt Disney, were born by ABC, which is where I started 40 years ago. It's kind of a coincidence. But Walt had the guts after he created Mickey Mouse in 1928, founded the company in 23, 
to try to make a feature-length animated film, which people thought was absolutely crazy. And Snow White, obviously, was the idea that he had. And uh, kind of the rest really is history. But it was not easy. It's an interesting story that you tell. I know of that story because there's been a fair amount written about it. Over here in the front. The wild thing is Snow White is still relevant today, too. Okay. That says a lot about Walt's vision creatively. Last question. <clears throat> Thank you. I just want to say a uh, huge fan of Modern Family. And uh, also, you, 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 you led with uh, mistakes not too long ago. If you could share, it sounds like you've taken some phenomenal risks uh, to support your growth, but could you share some examples of some mistakes you've made and the lessons you learned from them? I, I've made a, a bunch of mistakes. Um, fortunately, not that many big ones lately. <laughs> uh, one of the, I've had multiple jobs in the 40 year career I've been at the company. Uh, one of them was running what was co it's called ABC Entertainment, which is primetime programming. So Modern Family is among the programs that the head of ABC decided to put on ABC. <clears throat> in my day, which was 1989 to 1994 when I had that job, I made a lot of decisions about what programs to put on the air. Uh, some fortunately were really smart, like Home Improvement and America's Funniest Home Videos. I know I shouldn't be that proud of that, but it's, <laughs> it, it is still on the air, by the way. That was 1989 that I made that decision. But then I had a couple of wild ideas. One was called Twin Peaks. Here we are in Washington, wow. Twin Peaks. And a crazy guy named David Lynch pitched me the idea on a napkin at a restaurant, literally wrote out the story. And I liked his creative vision for it, and I thought television was kind of boring and needed to be, you know, needed to shake it up a little bit. It's interesting thinking about it today because I'm an aficionado of programs like Game of Thrones and Mad Men and the like, and they were, in a way, they, Twin Peaks was ahead of, the, ahead of the game. Now, it didn't last, but it was a huge risk, too. And then when I put Twin Peaks on, which got a fair amount of notoriety before it really failed, I decided I could do anything, so I decided to put a, 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 a police musical on the air. It was called Cop Rock. It can't be too many people who remember it, because it was only on for 11 episodes. It was a singing police mu Jeff show. Is like <laughs> and uh, I remember the first show, there was a trial, and uh, the... the uh, jury broke out, it, was, it turned out to be a gospel jury, and broke out a, a He's Guilty song. And it hit me while I was watching it. One of the things that hit me was that people had remote controls by that point, I know it sounds odd, and they could just hit a button, it's like a, an ejector seat, and they're gone. And it's the moment you're bored, you're gone. And they got bored pretty fast with that show. That was one, it didn't sink my career, but... Um, I still talk about it, it's kind of interesting. <laughs>